It's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you, you here on behalf of uh, Kenneth Davis, the Dean of the Law School. My name is Heinz Klug. I'm Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development and a member of this faculty. And uh, the Dean gives his apologies that unfortunately he had to be on the road uh, this week and so he's unable to be with us here today. I'd also like to uh, recognize a number of uh, Judge Fairchild's clerks and uh, Judge Fairchild's daughters who are in the audience with us today, Jennifer Fairchild Lord and Susan Fairchild Chase. Um, thank you very much. This is the 23rd Thomas E. Fairchild Lecture, and I welcome you here all today to it. Uh, it's my pleasure, too, to introduce uh, Judge Sessions, who will be delivering today's lecture, who will be talking to us today on the federal sentencing policy, A Path for the Future. The Honorable William K. Sessions III received his BA degree from Middlebury College and his JD from the National Law Center at George Washington University. He served in the United States Army ROTC and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1969. He served as first lieutenant from 1972 to 1973 and served in inactive reserve from 1973 to 1977. Before private practice, which he was in from 1978 to 1995, Judge Sessions held government positions as a legal intern in the Office of General Counsel of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, Executive Director of the Addison County Youth Services Bureau, and Attorney for the Addison County Public Defender's Office. In 1995, President William Clinton nominated Judge Sessions to serve as a judge for the United States District Court for the District of Vermont. He served as that court's chief judge from 2002 to 2011. Judge Sessions also served on the Judicial Branch Committee of the Ju Judicial Conference of the United States from 2002 to 2008, the Second Circuit Judicial Council from 2002 to 2010, and the Judicial Conference of the United States from 2008 to 2010. In 1999, Judge Sessions was nominated by President Clinton to serve a four-year term as a Commissioner and Vice Chair of the United States Sentencing Commission. President George Bush, W. Bush nominated Judge Sessions to serve a second six-year term in both positions. President Barack Obama nominated and the Senate confirmed Judge Sessions to serve as chair of the commission on October 21, 2009, a position he held with great distinction until February of this year. Judge Sessions has written law review articles, and he reminded me just before he started that uh, he also served as a law professor. Uh, law review article at the crossroads of the three branches, the U.S. Sentencing Commission's attempts to achieve sentencing reform in the midst of interbranch power struggles, to be published in the spring of 2011 in the Journal of Law and Politics at the University of Virginia School of Law. Uh, I'd like to welcome Judge Sessions to deliver the lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is just an incredible uh, honor and the pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, the Thomas D. Fairchild Lecture uh, is extraordinarily prestigious, uh, and he uh, was a legend, I think all of you know, um, in the federal judiciary. Served uh, for 41 years uh, on the bench. Um, he exhibited, uh, uh, as I look back through his life, incredible courage uh, politically, taking on uh, McCarthy in the 1950s. Um, uh, his uh, struggles in behalf of uh, civil liberties uh, and civil rights uh, were legendary. Um, and at the same time, with a career of such distinction, he's described by all who know him uh, as courteous, kind, polite, uh, and gentle. And uh, as a federal judge myself, and I see many of the federal judges here, wouldn't it be great if somebody said that about us <laughs> at some time in the future? It's also, uh, it's also just wonderful to be here. Um, Judge Connolly and Judge Crabb and uh, Lynn Edelman I saw. Um, I've known for a number of years and in, engaged in rigorous sentencing debates uh, over the year, uh, over the years. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here and I also note the representatives of the, of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Federal Defenders and and in the back row, we have the probation officers with whom I spoke, uh, with, spoke this morning. And 
and then the uh, students at Wisconsin. I should tell you that before I decided to go to the law school I went to, I applied and wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin. Um, but at that time, um, civil rights, or the, uh, the war in Vietnam was active, and I thought Washington would be a wonderful place. So this is, uh, for me, I guess, second best. Uh, but uh, here I am. Um, I've been asked um, uh, to give uh, a lecture, and I'm reminded of comments made uh, by Judge uh, Richard Arnold, who was a personal friend uh, of mine and, uh, and also a personal hero. Um, he, was, he served on the Sixth uh, Circuit with great distinction and, and uh, was, was spoken of as uh, President Clinton's um, uh, primary choice for the Supreme Court, but uh, developed cancer and, and soon thereafter died. But he was just a, a wonderful, uh, courteous, uh, brilliant human being, much like Judge Fairchild. Um, and he said this about, uh, about lectures. Uh, at a lecture at SMU, I dislike the term lecture. I'm not really sure why anybody would come to an event billed as a lecture. I suppose the students had to come. I don't know what inducement was offered to you or what punishment was threatened. But no one likes to be lectured at or lectured to. So I think of this as a conversation. Close quote. So just as Judge Arnold approached his lecture uh, as a conversation, uh, so shall I. My charge today is to discuss the evolution of federal sentencing policy since the Sentencing Reform Act of uh, 1984 and the changing role of the United States Sentencing uh, Commission. I'll focus particularly on the last uh, 11 years during which I served uh, on the commission. But in a broader sense, um, I'd like to reflect a bit upon my observations of how our system of government works on issues so controversial uh, as uh, sentencing policy. Uh, in the mid-1990s, um, there were turbulent times for the uh, U.S. Sentencing uh, Commission. In fact, from 1997 to 1999, there were no commissioners. Congress had chosen, uh, as a result of a dispute over crack cocaine, not to reappoint any of the commissioners who served on the commission. And in 1999, President Clinton uh, appointed me and six other commissioners uh, as a package uh, to serve uh, on the commission. We were confirmed by the Senate as part of a grand compromise uh, between the parties uh, in Congress I served for 11 years in the commission, uh, was reappointed by President Bush in 2004, and President Obama nominated me to serve as the chair of the commission soon after he assumed the presidency, and I was subsequently con uh, confirmed, and my second term uh, expired uh, just uh, very uh, recently. So one might ask, uh, how does a uh, judge from the sticks of Vermont uh, and I am from the sticks, I live in a town of 1,000, um, ever uh, come to the attention of Presidents Clinton, uh, Bush, uh, and Obama. Um, and I would say that it clearly was a merit selection. <laughs> right. My merit was having been a campaign manager and close friend of the chairman of the Senate <laughs> Judiciary <laughs> Committee, Patrick Leahy. But I guess that's, uh, that's a story for another day. Um, the Sentencing Commission sets uh, sentencing policy in a very generalized uh, way for the country. It establishes guidelines. It establishes policy directives for the courts. And in doing so, it works at the center of and in response to demands of the three branches uh, of government, each of which claims an interest in sentencing policy. Its members are appointed by the president uh, and confirmed uh, by the Senate. During that uh, decade-long uh, period during which I served, sentencing policy uh, endured a number of tidal waves of uh, change uh, in directives uh, brought by Congress uh, and uh, the Supreme Court. 
I'll describe um, as best I can the inherent tension uh, among the various branches of government and the inevitable upheavals in policy that that tension uh, creates. And many of those changes over the past 10 years have resulted in a consistent increase in penalties and not coincidentally uh, of the federal prison population has mushroomed. Between uh, 1999 and 2010, the federal prison population increased by 76% from 119,185 to 210,142, resulting in, in fact, a 37% overcapacity situation in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I then hope to give you um, my assessment of where federal sentencing policy is today and the impact of the changes that have been brought by these various decisions. And finally, um, I'll describe to you proposals for change in the guideline structure to provide a um, greater sense of stability uh, and overall fairness. Um, I propose uh, a new presumptive uh, guideline structure uh, in return for reduced or eliminate reduced numbers or elimination of mandatory minimum sentences. And this new system uh, would have wider ranges uh, within the sentencing table that I'll describe to you to provide more judicial discretion and would allow for greater use of offender characteristics to permit judges to more accurately tailor sentences to individual defendants and the circumstances of each case. And finally, I propose a more rigorous appellate review standard to ensure greater consistency um, across the country. But before setting forth uh, my proposals, let me put the federal uh, sentencing guideline system in historical context and go to the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984. The historical underpinnings of the commission and the guidelines appeared more than a, a decade before the enactment of the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, when in 1973, Judge Marvin E. Frankel published his brief but very powerful book, Criminal Sentences, Law Without Order. His monograph described the existing federal uh, sentencing system in which federal judges impose sentences within broad statutory ranges of imprisonment without any uniform standards and typically with little transparency. He described, in quote, wanton and freakish disparities that existed in federal sentencing where defendants with similar offenses and records received dramatically uh, different sentences from different judges. He reacted by uh, proposing a system with significant changes, including three primary reforms. The first is the creation of a sentencing commission made up of experts within uh, the uh, criminal justice field the creation of such a commission of, um, by such a commission of a detailed profile of factors that would include a numerical grading system of offense and offender characteristics. And then third, meaningful appellate review to assure consistency uh, across the country. Judge Frankel's proposals uh, resonated among academics and on Capitol Hill, particularly with Senators Edward Kennedy um, on the left and Strom Thurmond on the right uh, and led to the passage of the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984. In enacting the SRA, the Sentencing Reform Act, Congress sought to achieve several very noble purposes. One, the reduction of unwarranted sentencing disparities among defendants with similar records who have been found guilty of similar criminal conduct uh, while maintaining sufficient flexibility to permit individualized sentences when warranted by mitigating and aggravating factors. Second, uh, truth in sentencing by removing parole. And third, transparency in sentencing by creating a, date, a detailed rational process for determining a sentence. The guideline structure uh, was to be authored and monitored by a new sentencing uh, commission uh, 
the SRA envisioned the Sentencing Commission as an independent, in quote, expert agency located within the judiciary uh, but answerable to all three branches of government. The original Sentencing Commission submitted uh, proposed guidelines to Congress in 1987. Uh, the guidelines went into effect in November of that year. And the guidelines drafted by the Commission were a product of multiple compromises, as described by one of its primary authors, uh, Justice uh, Stephen Breyer. The sentencing guidelines that went into effect uh, reflected a mandatory or presumptive system. By mandatory, what that means is that a judge is restricted to impose a sentence within a given guideline range absent extraordinary circumstances which would warrant adjustment from that particular uh, range. I call it presumptive system. Others call it a mandatory system. Superimposed uh, on this existing, typically broad ranges that, uh, uh, of punishment were binding, narrower guidelines ranges that in many cases were driven by extremely detailed sentencing factors. And those ranges were modeled on a grid system with axes uh, for offense levels and criminal history. And with respect to the offense conduct, uh, the guidelines provided that virtually all aspects of the offense of conviction, as well as any related or relevant conduct before, during, and after the offense of conviction were pertinent at sentencing. That's all relevant conduct. That means any other conduct, even if that conduct did not result in a conviction, and in fact, uh, individuals who were acquitted of particular conduct could very well still have that conduct contribute uh, to the uh, guideline sentence under, that, under our system. The offense uh, in uh, a conduct would be rated in a scale of 43 uh, offense levels. And a separate scale was created for analyzing a defendant's criminal history um, with six categories. The initial determination of the sentencing range would be calculated where the offense level and the criminal history category met on the grid. And the severity levels were set based upon a study, an initial study of the average sentences that were imposed for given offenses at that particular time but then were skewed by uh, Congress passing new mandatory minimum sentences even before 1987 when the guidelines uh, came into effect. The Commission then added a number of aggravating and mitigating factors which increased or decreased the severity uh, of uh, the sentence for the underlying criminal offense and the Commission discouraged consideration of many offender characteristics such as age and family circumstances, and instead focused on a defendant's criminal record as the most important offender characteristic. At that stage in history, rehabilitation was not perceived of um, as a viable purpose in sentencing. Accountability uh, and punishment were the driving forces behind the initial guideline uh, system. Adjustments or departures from the guideline structure were authorized only in exceptional uh, circumstances. So what I'd like to do, I've got, you all have a handout, but I'd like to go through exactly how the federal system works because in the context of how it works, I can best describe what I'm proposing uh, by way of uh, changes to the guideline uh, system. The first, uh, the most important page is this one. It comes at the end uh, of the sentencing manual. For those of you who have manuals, uh, the, the manual is green. It actually is Vermont green. Why? Because the chair of the sentencing commission can pick the color of the manual. <laughs> and it's Vermont green. But anyway, if you go to the back, of the Vermont Green Manual, you see the table. There are 43 offense uh, numbers, and there are six criminal history scores or categories. 
the way, generally speaking, a judge determines the sentence range is to figure out what the offense level score is on the first axis and figure out what the criminal history score is on the second axis and then go to the box which defines the sentencing range. And the box, according to the initial commission and Congress, was very limited in nature, had to be within 25%, the low end to the top end. That's called the 25% rule. Just as an example, if you are, uh, after all of the factors, determined to have a, an offense level of 26, the judge goes down to level 26, figures out the criminal history score, determines that if, in fact, the criminal history score is 3, sentencing range, 78 to 97 months. That is, that is what defines uh, the criminal justice uh, sentencing. Now next, um, uh, to determine offense level. This is how the system looks. This is, um, this is the guideline for uh, drugs. 29% uh, now of all prosecutions in the federal courts across the country are drug offenses. What you do is you go to the base offense level. Most uh, offense levels begin this is the more aggravated ones, but most, most would begin at 26. All right? So the base offense level, that is the seriousness of the conduct, is determined at level 26. Then what you do is add specific offense characteristics. Now this is um, uh, the next addition. If, in fact, you have a dangerous weapon in the course of a drug transaction, that's a two-level increase. Um, here's some, the, uh, some other ones. Anabolic steroids. Um, there is such a thing called crime du jour in Washington, D.C., and a few years ago one remembers steroids. So what happens? How do, you, how do you incorporate steroids into the guideline system to reflect Congress's wish to increase penalty for steroids? Will you put it as an enhancement in 2D1.1, the guidelines? So as a result, you look to here, if the defendant distributed anabolic steroids to an athlete, because Congress really want, was concerned about athletes getting steroids, there's a two-level increase. This is the beginning of what you'll hear about in terms of enhancement creep. Once you start down the line of identifying all of the factors which contribute to an appropriate sentence, Congress looks at this, and if they feel that they want a particular behavior uh, to warrant an increase, they direct the commission now to do it. That wasn't the way the commission started, but that's the way uh, we have uh, evolved. And then, um, after you've gone through all the enhancements, there are various major enhancements. Role in the offense. If you have an aggravated role, if you're a leader or supervisor, you get a certain number of points. If you have a mitigating role, you have a certain number of points. And we, recently we passed what's called a mitigating role cap. Oftentimes people hear about the federal system and all the girlfriends because they're at the, the bottom of the system. We have passed a number of years ago uh, called a mitigating role cap, which limits the penalties for low-level drug defendants uh, whenever they have a mitigating role uh, reduction. And then acceptance responsibility. Um, if a defendant uh, pleads guilty uh, and acknowledges acceptance responsibility, there's a three-level reduction. Now, some would say that's wise from a policy perspective because when somebody accepts responsibility, all the studies indicate that person creates less of a risk of recidivism. Other people would suggest you reduce the penalty by uh, three levels for acceptance responsibility, it really is increasing the penalty if you choose to go to trial, right? So if you're at level 26, actually I'll go back and just show you the impact. Let's say 78 to 97 months, you start at level 26, criminal history category 3, 78 to 97 months. If you accept responsibility and get a three-level reduction, that knocks you down, one, two, three, 57 months you have now just saved yourself almost two years in prison. Now some would say you should start at 57 and then, um, and then that shouldn't discourage 
um, right to trial. But the, the fact is, as a result of acceptance responsibility and other incentives for pleading, it is fair to say that 98% uh, of all criminal cases in federal court resolve, are resolved by plea. Now, this is where the changes that I'll talk about are most uh, significant. When we started in uh, 1987, the, uh, the Sentencing Commission thought Congress said uh, personal characteristics should be discouraged. So as a result, you see language like age is not ordinarily relevant in determining departures. Mental and emotional conditions not ordinarily relevant in determining uh, a sentence. Essentially what the guidelines are saying is don't consider those factors as significant in the sentence that you intend to impose. And what was ignored, what has now come to light as a result of the Booker decision, is another statute which is uh, called 3553A, which lists factors that judges should consider in sentencing. And those factors require judges to consider those human characteristics of a defendant, uh, such as age, emotional condition, addictions, etc. cetera. Uh, and so judges today are, have been caught in a bind between the guidelines, which say don't consider these factors, and 3553A, which say, do consider them, and in fact, you must. And that's what the commission tried to resolve um, in, um, um, in the future. So I'll be talking about this in a while. Okay. All right, from the outset, um, sentencing judges um, criticized uh, the guideline system as being uh, too complex, too rigid, too harsh, um, um, and having replaced a judge's traditional sentencing discretion with an inflexible formula uh, that turned judges uh, into computers. Um, judges in particular objected to the inability to use offender characteristics and uh, fashion sentences they deemed uh, to be just. Now the commission's role in relationship to the uh, branches of government the commission uh, functions at the crossroads or at the vortex or in the middle of the three branches uh, of government. Each branch has a constitutional investment in sentencing policy. Congress sets the crimes and sets the penalties, and they do so by setting mandatory minimums, if they wish, but also maximum penalties. The executive, Department of Justice, has an interest in enforcing the laws and rigorously enforcing the laws and their views of enforcement they believe oftentimes should dominate sentencing policy and judges on the other hand believe that they are in the best position to assess all of the factors which uh, should be considered in arriving at a just determination including the individual characteristics of a defendant um, as well as the circumstances of uh, the cases. And frankly, there is little or no trust among the branches uh, of government. Um, Congress insists that the Commission work for them, and when we made various efforts most recently to move the guidelines in the past year toward more judicial discretion, there was an outcry uh, from uh, Congress. And when the PROTECT Act happened and Congress took authority from judges, there was an outcry from judges. Uh, because what in the world does Congress have uh, in regard to, had to say in regard to uh, sentencing? Each branch uh, has a very unique uh, interest, and the struggle over the interests of each branch of government has essentially dominated the uh, Commission's history since its inception. Uh, when the Sentencing Reform Act was uh, passed, the Commission uh, was granted wide latitude concerning federal sentencing policy, and yet within two years, by 1986, um, before even the guidelines took effect, Congress proceeded to co-opt a significant area of sentencing policy 
by enacting mandatory minimum statutory penalties uh, in a very large segment of uh, federal criminal cases, mostly drugs and firearms. Congress imposed five and 10 year mandatory minimum sentences uh, for numerous drug trafficking, drug trafficking offenses, a five year mandatory minimum sentence if a weapon was possessed in furtherance of a uh, drug uh, activity. Mandatory minimum means that the sentence of five years or 10 years has to be imposed and cannot be changed by a judge absent extraordinary circumstances which uh, I won't address at this particular point. These mandatory minimum sentences conflict both in practice and spirit with a guideline system. Their impact uh, is felt in two ways. Um, first, um, the statutory mandatory minimum sentences are often greater than the sentences uh, called for by the guidelines, which results in the guideline sentences being essentially trumped by the mandatory minimums. But second, the original commission made an important policy decision, which has not been uh, changed, where Congress had made a policy decision regarding penalties for given criminal acts by imposing mandatory minimums, the commission then felt it had to incorporate those policy decisions uh, into the guidelines so that cliffs between mandatory minimum sentences and guideline sentences would be minimized. Thus, the guideline sentences were impacted directly by passage of mandatory minimums. Once the mandatory minimums were passed by Congress, the guidelines went up uh, in, in appropriate and in, in accordingly, uh, resulting again in a ra constant ratcheting up of penalties uh, as a result of congressional action. And in addition to, or sometimes in lieu of mandatory minimums, Congress has issued countless directives uh, to the commission over the past uh, 25 years. There have been different species of directives, some of which uh, required precise changes uh, in specific guidelines. Some di uh, directives uh, have been appropriate reflections of congressional uh, oversight, uh, while others have invaded the detail work of the sentencing uh, commission. Such was the case with the directives issued by the PROTECT Act in 2003, which mandated precise changes to the guidelines. And even when directives have not dictated specific increases in guideline penalties, the Commission often felt compelled to add additional aggravating factors and thereby increase guideline sentences in order to ward off mandatory minimum penalties. The Commission's relationship with Congress became most strained in 1995 over mandatory uh, minimum sentences for crack cocaine. Congress had set a five-year threshold penalty for possession or distribution of five grams of crack cocaine, while the same threshold for powder cocaine uh, was set at 500 grams, or a 100 to 1 ratio. The Commission voted um, by four to three to promulgate an amendment and issue an accompanying report recommending the penalties for powder and crack be equalized. For the first and only time in history, Congress flatly rejected the amendment, rejected a, an accompanying amendment for money laundering, and then refused to reappoint any of the commissioners um, who had voted uh, on that amendment. And by 1997, late 97, the Sentencing Commission had no commissioners, and essentially, with no commissioners, um, no ability to act. And if there's no ability to act, um, then there is essentially no commission. And if there's no commission, there can be no guideline structure. And as a result, the threat was reversion to mandatory minimum sentences. Meanwhile, the uh, struggle between uh, Congress and the judiciary over sentencing policy uh, continued. So in 1996, the Supreme Court, in a case called Kuhn versus United States, reallocated to district court judges more discretion to impose sentences below the guideline ranges by amending appellate standards for departures. And this begins the battle back and forth 
between branches of government. In Kuhn, uh, written by Justice Breyer, who wrote the guidelines, um, the court held that a sentencing judge's discretion to depart from a sentence within the guideline range was to be reviewed with, in quote, substantial deference on appeal. For abuse of discretion, rather than a de novo standard, a much more rigorous standard, that the executive branch and that Congress um, advocated. Within three years of uh, the Kuhn decision, district courts uh, were exercising broader discretion, departing from the guidelines in a significantly greater number. Uh, between 1995 and 1999, the number of non-government sponsored, that's judge-initiated departures, increased, well, nearly doubled rising from 8.4% to 15.8%. Now, in response to judicial discretion resulting in these departures, Congress enacted the PROTECT Act of 2003, which reallocated uh, the power in federal sentencing arena away from the judiciary. Among other things, it required the Attorney General to report to Congress on downward departures and essentially report on judges who were downwardly departing from the guidelines. It amended the SRA to provide for a maximum, rather than a, as before, a minimum of three federal judges as members of the commission. And <laughs> I will say I was on the commission at that point, and uh, just, a, just a general observation, um, um, they're, they're made up of Republicans and Democrats, and some of some of my best friends were Republicans. Um, and what actually I observed, we had five judges at that time, is that it made no difference what your political philosophy was. When you're talking about sentencing policy, you're talking about who makes the decision, judges or Congress or the executive. And as a result, there was a fairly significant uniformity of approach among the various judges. <laughs> we should. And as a result, Congress decides to eliminate us from the majority on the uh, commission. Anyway, the legislation also dictated precise changes in child pornography guidelines. And it actually went through and it mandated specific offense levels for certain conduct and severely restricted downward departures in these and other types of cases the act then provided a new appellate standard, went back to the pre kuhn era of de novo review, giving appellate courts a, a much stronger hand in reducing, in eliminating judicial discretion at the district court uh, level. And as a result of that, significant uh, reduction in the number of departures. There also was uh, essentially and unfortunately a real attack on one of uh, our colleagues um, which discouraged, would discourage many judges from uh, taking on uh, Congress. Then the Supreme Court responded quickly with a series of cases which had the effect of dramatically reclaiming judicial discretion uh, in sentencing. It first began with Blakely, Apprendi, but then Blakely, which construed a state presumptive guideline system, which is quite similar to the federal uh, system, and the court held that under the Sixth Amendment, um, if a guideline system requires a sentence to be within a certain guideline range, which is true of our system, that a jury, not a judge, has to make that determination. And that the standard of proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. So what that means is if you have a guideline range and you want to go up, there has to be a proof beyond a reasonable doubt and the defendant has a right uh, to a jury trial that was expanded in the Booker case to apply to the federal system. So then we are in a situation where under the federal system, judges would not be able to increase penalties uh, above a range or in the, all of those enhancements, you couldn't use them because you're increasing the range. A jury would have the right to be able to look at all of those. So what happened as a result, and you can guess who wrote this opinion, Justice Breyer, is we, we develop an advisory system. We can do this. We can keep the guideline system exists as long as it's advisory and not binding. And as a result, no longer are the guidelines binding or presumptive or mandatory 
their advisory. And in fact, what we're instructed to do, frankly, is to go through a three-stage process. We first uh, determine what the guidelines are. The guidelines remain um, relevant. We then go through departures, all except in the Seventh Circuit, but now you're back because we reversed the Seventh Circuit. Most recently, Barbara, we did. We reversed the Seventh Circuit. Um, uh, you see, you go through departures, and then you go to the variances under 3553A. You go through that, st that uh, three-step uh, process. Most recently, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a case called Pepper versus United States in a most extraordinary way. And uh, this is uh, you know, one of the clearest challenges that I have seen um, because there is this battle going on. S Justice Sotomayor wrote in this opinion that judges need to give um, respect. I think it's called, a, it's a level of respect to the guide, respectful consideration to the guidelines. But that if any judge anywhere disagreed with a policy determination made by the Sentencing Commission or by Congress or by what Congress said the Sentencing Commission should do, if you had disagreed with it, you could reject it. You didn't have to follow it. You just go to 3553A and decide whatever sentence you want. Now, um, I think that, you know, that's, a, that's an assertion of power um, and, it's, it, and it's strong. Um, but that, I mean, that is a challenge to Congress. And what, uh, what um, uh, Justice Breyer wrote in the Booker decision, this one little section, said, the ball is now in the court, in Congress's court. They have to decide what comes next in this battle. Now, people look uh, to what was called a Booker fix, we all went around the country thinking the Booker fix was just uh, frightening. Uh, they're going to they're going to do something dramatic like the Protect Act, and they're going to lock up all the judges who <laughs> depart. And, right? um, there is no Booker fix in the world. There are mandatory minimums, and that's the only way Congress can respond. If Congress wants control over sentences. Uh, they just passed mandatory minimum sentences. And I will tell you, one of the most rigorous things that we did on the commission for years is try to fight on Capitol Hill mandatory minimum sentences. And right now, the call for mandatory minimum sentencing on Capitol Hill is um, loud. Uh, last year, the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, by a large vote, passed a mandatory minimum penalty for possession of child pornography. Didn't get to Congress because it was too late. That's coming back. There are mandatory minimums assigned to literally every criminal case, every criminal issue that comes before Congress. So what is the answer? The answer isn't some wave of an act like the PROTECT Act. It's we are taking over sentencing through um, mandatory uh, minimum sentences. So where is uh, where's, um, sentencing policy uh, at this point? And first I want to talk about judges and the guideline uh, culture. Um, it is, if you look at the statistics of the commission and uh, in light of the fact I'm just going to talk at this point and put aside uh, my notes, okay. Um, if you look at, at what's happening to sentences across the country, you see a, a gradual increase and the level of departures, the number of departures across the country. Um, essentially, that's gone from 13% of departures and variances. That sentences below the guidelines, which judges do on their own, to now in excess of 18%. Now, within guideline range, has gone from over 60% down to slightly over 50%. But what you also see across the country is a shocking increase in the level of disparity across the country both among the circuits and also within individual courthouses. As an example, compare the D.C. Circuit, which sentences within the guideline range 31.1% of the times. Compare that to the Seventh Circuit, 71.8, I'm sorry, the Fifth Circuit, 71.8% of the times. If you're in the Fifth Circuit, your chances are 71% that you will get a guideline sentence 
If you're in D.C., it's 31 percent. We'll then go to within uh, circuits themselves. In the District of Massachusetts, they sentence within the guideline ranges, you know, at the end when we go through the system, 28 percent of the time. That's all. 28 percent of the time. Some would say, what's the point of a guideline system? 28 percent of the time. Well, in Puerto Rico, which is also in the First Circuit, they uh, sentence within the guideline range 72 percent of the time. Makes big difference where you're arrested. And then there was a study that was done in Boston of the judges in Boston. The commission refuses to disclose the, the uh, individual judges' statistics to protect judges from congressional uh, oversight. But Boston, for some reason, chose to release their statistics. Out comes a study uh, by a professor, Brian Scott, in the Stanford Law Review, which essentially describes this growing disparity uh, among the judges in Boston. Some, three, are described as free at last. <laughs> others are described same as usual. And others are somewhere in the middle. I talked to a judge from Boston who was in the, in the hall one day and she overheard a lawyer talking to a client. I got the good news and the bad news. The good news is you didn't get Judge X. The bad news is you didn't get Judge Y. You got Judge Z. Now, is there something wrong with that? I think there is. It doesn't necessarily require a, a, a guideline system that is so compartmentalized and detailed as existed in the past. But there needs to be something to create a national norm across the country, it seems to me. And the fact is, we are ripe for that because the guideline system, for all of the criticism that is issued across the country, is in fact very popular with judges. Most of the judges who serve right now started after the guidelines began. We did a study, the Sentencing Commission did a study of all the federal judges. We were around the country and we uh, conducted all of these evidentiary hearings for a year and a half. And then we had a, a, a study in which two-thirds of all of the district court judges responded. And the responses were just incredibly interesting. They like the advisory system that exists. 75% prefer that as opposed to a more rigorous uh, presumptive system. But at the same time, you start asking detailed questions and you see uh, the support for the system. 78% um, said it reduced uh, disparity. The guidelines reduced disparity. 67% said guidelines increase uh, fairness across the country. The relevant conduct, you know, when you consider all of the evidence, all the things that the defendant did with a preponderance of evidence standard, extraordinarily popular in excess of 75% of all the judges think that this should be applied. And then when you go through what they think of sentencing severity, with the exception of child pornography and crack cocaine, most judges feel the severity level of all of the other offenses is fair. And in fact, one of the most interesting things that I've, I tried to start, well, I did start when I became chair, is recording average sentences, um, not just whether you depart or not, because the departure is going up and, you know, there's no question about that. But the average sentences are incredibly consistent for 10 years plus, with the exception of child pornography and uh, also crack cocaine. You take any other drug, 10 years ago, the sentences before, well before Booker were just about the same as they are now. The sentences for firearm offenses are flat for an excess of 10 years. People complain about white collar offenses being treated so leniently now. In fact, the average white collar offense is going up gradually, but going up across the country. Essentially, what has happened is, I think, that much of the language of the guidelines has been incorporated within our colleagues, um, and they've accepted it with criticisms, no doubt, uh, and their criticisms in other ways. Um, but essentially, there is a culture now within the judiciary that could very well accept a guideline system that provides more cabined discretion, as long as there is discretion to do what they think is right. And the other interesting thing is that most of the departures we talk about these high departure rates. 
The average departure for a judge-initiated departure is 12 months. That's been the same as 10 years ago. So essentially what I think happens oftentimes is judges look at a defendant and they look at people in the back, they feel compassion for the defendant in that situation and they want to give that defendant a break. They use the guidelines as a mechanism to establish the framework and then they adjust by giving 12 months off. Well, how about if you set up a guideline system which incorporated that 12 months into broader ranges so that you don't need to depart you can actually do it within the guideline system, which then politically would be much more palpable. Now I want to say a little bit about mandatory minimum sentences. Since I started, um, the uh, numbers of mandatory minimum sentences have increased by 78%. There are now over 170 provisions which bear mandatory minimum sentences. 28% of all the federal cases uh, are uh, for sentences that are, that are for offenses that have mandatory minimums. And if you reduce the uh, immigration cases, it goes up to 40%. So 40% of all of our sentences have offenses for which mandatory minimums set by Congress have been involved. The impact um, is uh, fairly dramatic. But I want to say that mandatory minimums are, are a blunt instrument. Um, and we sometimes get lost in the debate about mandatory minimums as to what exactly we're talking about. There is a particular philosophy uh, which says there is wisdom in certainty of punishment. In fact, there are studies which indicate that it is the certainty of punishment which deters crime. It is not the length of sentence. Anything over six months makes little or no impact on deterrence. It's the certainty of punishment. Well, if you had a mandatory minimum sentence which had a six-month sentence, you have certainty of punishment, and yet you're not salting away defendants with a level of severity which is unjustified. It is sometimes the, it's the, it's the severity of the, of the mandatory minimums which is, in fact, so controversial and so counterproductive uh, to the uh, guideline uh, system. The last of, I've talked about uh, is the um, Congress's wish to micromanage the guideline system. I think I've talked about that uh, enough. But the most uh, exciting change that I hope will happen, will continue to happen, is in the use of offender characteristics. And by offender characteristics, I mean age, emotional condition, mental condition. They were discouraged under the guidelines. This past year, we changed that. For the first time, Offender characteristics are now relevant in determining whether departures are justified within the guideline structure. We also incorporated alternatives to imprisonment. We expanded the ranges by which alternatives were available for defendants for the first time uh, ever since I've been on the commission. And I will say that in the 10 years prior to this year, or last year, I don't ever remember the word drug treatment being mentioned. We now have a guideline way in which judges can decide, rather than put people in jail, put them in treatment as an option. Um, those are, they're small, they're relatively low level, um, but they're, they're important in a number of ways. They tell people in the community, probation officers in particular, that this is where we're headed. And more than that, hopefully the commission will be headed with a second um, function, and that's to educate people within the system about the social sciences related to offender characteristics. And if, in fact, we can change the focus of the commission to that, then um, I think we're taking a tremendous step forward to educate people about how social, um, how social studies can be used. Now, coming to an end, my uh, proposal. And um, this is uh, essentially it. Um, again, you have 43 offense levels. And the reason I don't change the number of levels is because um, there is a massive amount of research the Commission has done in regard to each of these offense levels. Recidivism rates, studies about how they impact particular uh, 
classes or socioeconomic levels, et cetera, and you, if you remove this, the category one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, um, you lose that. So rather than that, take broad ranges, combine a number of offense levels, have a middle range, which is the standard, and have within this broader range an advisory system. That is, judges would have the ability with this much broader range, and these are just numbers I suggested, and have also reduced the, the, uh, the, the criminal history score to, to four. But judges would have broader ranges based upon individual circumstances of a case. And then, rather than have this uh, list of offender uh, of enhancements under 2D1, uh, under all of the guidelines, put most of those uh, enhancements as advisory right within this structure. You can't go up, because if you go up from, boy, go up this way, when you shift from this box to this box, the jury trial right attaches under Blakely. So what you do is you set these offender characteristics, this myriad of characteristics, and give judges some guidance about this is how you use them, and you use them within this broader range. And this, frankly, would take advantage of what really is the judge's wishes, and that is to provide some flexibility and some discretion. Then um, there are certain factors, which are core factors, which uh, would have to be given to a jury to decide. They include uh, drug quantity, uh, loss amount, uh, use of guns, probably, use of violence. Those are things which are so significant that they may very well warrant a fairly significant increase, in which case the jury trial right exists. So you basically take these, I would say, 100 uh, of enhancements, incorporate them as guidelines for judges. Think about these. Go to the top end. If you see some of the factors which uh, justify a top end sentence, go to the low end if you feel that that's appropriate, but give more discretion uh, and, uh, well, give more discretion to judges. I think one of the problems that we've had, frankly, is that judges have not been given enough respect within the system to be able to decide based upon what is before them within given norms of society. Uh, the appropriate sentence uh, in a given case. So you have broader ranges with sub-ranges. Um, in addition, offender characteristics become, uh, it seems to me, central. And I've incorporated that uh, literally within uh, this uh, proposal. And that is the offender characteristics should be very much a part of the guideline structure and should be considered uh, in uh, detail. Then, um, because you need consistency across the country so that if you're in Massachusetts, you're not being treated significantly differently than uh, Puerto Rico, you apply a somewhat more rigorous appellate standard and to require, ju uh, to require judges to follow the norms. It still means that you can depart. It still means that you can vary under 3553A. There are always exceptional circumstances. But to actually suggest that you have an appellate standard which requires judges to actually analyze in detail grounds for departure, I think would warrant uh, this much, uh, this much uh, broader uh, system. Finally, it's a, it's a simplification. Um, this would be a much more um, simplified uh, system once it's set up because all of the enhancements are within advisory ranges. I will tell you that, and all of the judges here will tell you as well, you get involved in a sentencing for a complex fraud case, you spend most of your time trying to assess loss amount, trying to assess uh, the various enhancements, the detailed various enhancements, and if in fact those are within an advisory system in a broader range, it becomes quite simplified and uh, easy uh, to uh, employ. So I've gone on for about an hour, and I, um, so I forgot my speech, um, <laughs> but it'll be written in the Wisconsin Law Review at some point. So. so
can I, can I open it up for any questions that anyone have just for a couple of minutes? We'll break certainly by uh, 5.15. Yes. There are two sovereigns that prosecute in every state. And the idea that there can be consistent sentencing across the country in federal cases is great. But the fact and the reality is that these guidelines don't apply to state prosecutions. And prosecutors in both state and federal every day are trading where they bring cases in order to get the result they want. Uh, state judges, especially in this state, are unfortunately uh, dominated by politics especially recently, and I would say that the... I think you uh, have your chief justice in the audience, but I, I wouldn't... <laughs> it's my opinion. <laughs> yep. uh, so how is it that, what is so wrong with giving federal judges who are free from that political type of influence the, in, uh, the total discretion to uh, sentence as they want, as they did in the 70s? And just a quick footnote is, when I was in AUSA in the 70s, our office in Eastern District of Wisconsin, we weren't allowed to make sentencing recommendations. That was the judge's job. I can't remember a single case in four years where we made a sentencing recommendation. Okay. Well, you're, uh, you're a defendant, and you're in that uh, hallway in Boston, Massachusetts. And the, and the lawyer says, let's face it, the most important decision in how you're going to be treated is how that wheel spins and which judge you got. And if you got a good one, you're in great shape. You got a bad one, you might as well plead guilty and, and pray uh, that in your next life, you'll run a better life. Um, is that a fair system? It's not. I mean, it, it, just, it just isn't. Um, that's the first answer. The second answer is people in the system, you and I, believe that this is our system. We're judges, practitioners. This is our system. We know how to run it. Congress has, a, has an interest in sentencing policy as well. They do have an interest, and it's a legitimate interest, and it's important to recognize they have an interest. And so how does one incorporate their interest in absolutely establishing the norm for the country in terms of penalties? And I think that's, you know, it's, that's extraordinarily important because they do have a voice. And you need to develop a system, it seems to me, which is less dependent upon who the judge is, more dependent upon a norm which is established as long as there's sufficient flexibility in its enforcement. Uh, and the final thing is, uh, and I will uh, debate uh, Judge Edelman about this for uh, long periods of uh, time. I was very actively involved in the, in the crack, and I've talked to him about it. The crack amendment in 2007 I was very involved in and thrilled about and mitigating roll cap. I, those are very uh, close uh, to my heart. But the fact is this system is not sustainable. You, you, when you have the Supreme Court of the United States saying to Congress, I'm telling judges they don't need to listen to anything you say. Really. I mean, what do you expect they're going to do? Well, they're going to impose mandatory minimum sentences, which they are more than willing to do. And it's not just one party. It's both. So uh, I think, you know, right now there's a window of opportunity in history, it seems to me. At this particular point, if, you know, if the Department of Justice ever took a strong stand on this and, uh, and proposed some really good ways of Eliminating mandatory minimums in return for a guideline structure that has some teeth, it's a possibility that that could happen. Um, but other than that, it's, um, you know, it's mandatory minimum upon mandatory minimum upon mandatory minimum. And uh, I will say that the most uh, troublesome part of the job as a judge, and I'm sure everyone would agree, is when you're looking at a young person and saying 10 years in prison when you feel, feel that that's a gross injustice. And it happens all the time. And uh, so is there a way that we could develop a system that would uh, discourage that? And I think this is the way to do it. Okay. Yes.
The most disturbing statistic you mentioned was that 98% of all cases result in pleas. And it's come to the point now where the only discretion that seems not reviewable is the U.S. Attorney's discretion. And uh, some U.S. attorneys around the country have exercised that discretion to bring cases for, say, deprivation of honest services that, in the view of some, is designed to interfere in gubernatorial elections and elsewhere. What do you, what is your opinion, because it is sentencing related, on um, a legislative change that would permit appellate review or, in, in the first instance, judicial review of the U.S. attorney's discretion under some circumstances in what to bring and uh, stopping the process at that stage? Um, well, I, you know, I, appreciate, I appreciate the argument that the U.S. attorney has tremendous authority. Um, just as an example, I've had a recent trial. Defendant is facing 10-year mandatory minimum, has a previous conviction. If you file an 851 notice, doubles the mandatory minimum, 10 to 20. Defendant is told, um, okay, we've got this. Uh, you, will you plead to the 10-year? No, filed the 851, convicted, 20, okay? That's power. Now, the fact is, um, I, I, I don't think we have uh, the expertise as judges, um, and I don't think we have the authority, frankly, to supervise uh, and look over uh, prosecutorial decisions. And um, actually, I've been fairly consistent about that because um, there's, a, there's a, this motion that the government can file for substantial assistance. If a person provides substantial assistance under 5K1.1, then uh, the judge has free reign to go below mandatory minimums or whatever. And judges are saying, we should have the right to give that 5K1. I don't think so. I think the prosecutor, if they're functioning correctly, is best uh, in the position to make those kinds of policy determinations be very reluctant to, uh, to get the judiciary involved in second-guessing those kinds of decisions. But frankly, it's an academic question because in the real world, it ain't ever going to happen. There is no Congress ever that would suggest uh, that the judges should, should uh, make policy decisions over the U.S. attorneys. And in fact, uh, just the opposite. Congress is constantly seeking to give U.S. attorneys more authority than judges. Has something to do with life tenure. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like this thing about life tenure. <laughs> yes? Uh, what I was, with your proposal regarding a smaller but more um, set of guidelines and then a more rigorous standard review, kind of trading off on the mandatory minimums, what makes you think that Congress five years from now, three years from now would respect that and not still go forward with more mandatory minimums? Um, I, I have no faith, really. <laughs> um, but I have no option. I mean, I, I, have, you know, I, I, mean, I really think um, that uh, there are more and more mandatory minimums coming, the way, coming down the road. It's not, it's not only just because of the sentencing statistics here. What led to the PROTECT Act um, was child pornography. Um, you know, we have a very severe penalties for child pornography. Um, and those are all directed by Congress. Congress said increase here, increase there, increase there, increase all of those enhancements congressionally directed. As a result, because the possession of, of child pornography is discretionary, um, the departure rate from judges on child pornography cases is well in excess of 50%. And um, I know of some judges who, you know, have been uh, asked uh, when they're up for appeal, they want all their sentencing statistics. Congress wants the sentencing statistics of each judge who's up for appeal uh, uh, on, on, uh, up for an appellate position, and in particular, child pornography sentences. So we now have this situation in which there are massive numbers of departures for child pornography, and. This is the thing that triggered the PROTECT Act in 2003, and I, I just don't see them, I don't see Congress backing off in, in light of that. Um, but having said that, sure, five years down the road, they could very well do that, uh, but this would be essentially an assertion that we have a guideline system which exists. It's, uh, it's uh, somewhat rigorous, uh, 
Why do you need mandatory minimum sentences? You don't, if you want the system to exist. Any other questions at all? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for an extraordinary speech. Uh, and now we're going to impose one of our quaint traditions on Judge Sessions. As, as a gift, the law school gives a god. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> With my name on it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs>